We have increasingly heard the term behavioral economics since the financial meltdown of 2008, but there is a new field on the horizon. It's called behavioral finance. And joining us now to tell us more about this area of economic study, here's Lisa Kramer. She is professor of finance at the University of Toronto's Rotman School of Management, and it's good to have you here at TVO. Thank you. First it's time good to on, be here. isn't it? It is. I think, yeah, good. Long overdue. Okay, behavioral finance. Give us your definition. So it's the notion that we are human, essentially. And when we make financial decisions, our brains come into play, and we don't always do what is in our own best interest. So we are prone to making mistakes sometimes. We're uh, subject to our emotions. We take mental shortcuts. And the outcome of those sorts of decisions sometimes isn't what we hope it would be. That sounds a bit like behavioral economics, so what's the difference? The difference is the application. So we're relying on all of the same tools. It's just a question of what we're studying. So in behavioral finance, we're interested in the financial decisions people make, the choices between stocks and bonds, whether to invest at all. We like to encourage people to save for the future, and that is the domain of behavioral finance. Is it your position that the length of the days and all of this other stuff can it have an impact on the decisions people make in their financial lives? Absolutely. How so? We've got lots of evidence now. Having stud studied this topic for more than a decade now, I've been interested in how our environment influences our willingness to take financial risk. And you point to the length of day. You know, in the fall and winter in Canada, we have not a lot of daylight to deal with. And this actually impacts our brains. You know, our, we, we produce hormones as a function of the daylight exposure that, that we enjoy. And our moods are sort of affected by, by daylight in, through that conduit. And when we become sort of more despondent in the fall and winter months, we also become less willing to take financial risk. And when a big bunch of us experiences similar changes in our mood at the same time, this can affect the prices of financial assets that trade in, in big markets. For example? For example, in the fall, it's probably not a coincidence that lots of big market crashes have occurred. So the crash of 1929, October. The crash of 1987, October. Even the 2008 market crash, October. September, actually. September, yeah, September yeah, October. Before. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's just all concentrated in the fall. And you think it, 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 part of the reason would be this, days are shorter? We're going a little, we're, we're unhappier? We are. We're all getting a little bit more despondent. And mm -hmm. with that change in our mood comes less of an appetite for financial risk. And I don't want to make the crazy claim that this is the only thing that is at play. Mm -hmm. You know, market crashes aren't caused by this. But when there's bad economic news, when things are going a little sideways in markets already, and as humans, we're feeling a little bit nervous and averse to risk, all of a sudden we can decide, hey, I'm getting out of here. I'm going to sell all my risky stock. And this can lead to really big changes in markets. I don't know how specifically in terms of geographic regions you do your research because, of course, in the southern United States, the weather is just fine in September, right? Or December or February for that matter. Uh, have you been able to discern whether or not there are decision differences in investing between people who live, say, in Arizona, California, or Florida versus those who live in you know, Saskatchewan, Ontario, New York State, uh, whatever. Yeah, great question. We can actually exploit differences in latitude across different regions because, of course, the further north you go in the winter, the less daylight there is. So we've looked at a broad range of countries, and the more north we go, the bigger these seasonal effects in markets. And as you might guess, when we look at southern hemisphere countries where the seasons are out of sync by six months, everything shifts by six months in markets as well. So yeah, absolutely, location matters. Have you had any other people in the field push back at you on this and say, you know what, you are, you're pushing it. You're trying to make connections where they really are fairly tenuous. Yes, absolutely. Um, the work has had its critics. And I think that that's just a natural thing to happen in academia. Um, the, the criticism has actually raised my work to a higher standard. Higher standard. So whenever we, we are sort of criticized, we think about the criticism and ask ourselves, you know, how can we address that potential problem? And this is why I've been working on the topic for more than a decade. Hmm. You know, it's been a series of papers that have looked at trying to answer the, the shortcomings 
and you know, having worked on this for so long now, I, I've really come to believe that this is a real phenomenon. And I think that the discipline has you know, come to embrace that as well. Behavioral economics, though, which, which predates this theory mm -hmm. of, you know, several years, mm -hmm. they took a little while to catch on too before mainstream economics sort of bought into it, right? So sure. is, is it a matter of time? You know, behavioral economics still has its critics, right. you know, so um, it, it has taken time and I think that as time goes on, behavioral finance is catching on more and more as well. You know, even the um, one of the most recent uh, Nobel Prizes uh, just over a year ago went to Bob Schiller, who does work in behavioral mm -hmm. finance. And you know, he still gets into fights with Eugene Fama, another big name in, in finance circles. Uh, so everybody, you know, just does their best and, and hopes that they're doing, you know, careful work and can answer the, the critics as best they can. Mm. What's the acronym you use? It's SAD? What does yeah. SAD stand for? SAD stands for Seasonal Affective Disorder and it affects up to 10% of the population depending on where you live. People who live at, you know, at the North Pole are going to be more likely to suffer from this severe form of depression through the, the fall and winter months. Uh, closer to the equator, of course, you have 12 hours of daylight all year round. You're not going to have a lot of seasonal variation in mood. But um, beyond the equator, you know, everywhere else, we find that people in general do experience changes in mood, even if they don't suffer from the severe form of SAD, they do experience more moderate sort of changes in their, their mood and consequently experience these seasonal changes in their willingness to take financial risk as well. And, and I can support this with some research I've done using experiments. So um, many hundreds, in fact, over a thousand people have taken part in experiments that I've done where I ask them kind of how they're doing through the seasons and what kinds of financial risks they're willing to take where real money is at stake uh, based on their, their choices. And we find really big changes through the seasons. So if this theory takes on added currency, and let's face it, there's a, I mean, there's a lot of common sense to this, right? I mean, if you're depressed, you're not going to make as good decisions as you would if you weren't depressed, presumably, right? Yeah. So um, what's the solution to our bad behavior as a result of shorter days, increased depression, all of these other external factors that you uh, might suggest? Well, I think the first step is to recognize that, that this is real. It's just completely natural to experience emotions and to try to pretend that we can make decisions immune from our emotions is just naive. So, you know, a lot of economics is actually built on the premise that emotions don't affect decisions. So step one is recognize this is just silly. You know, emotions are real. Anybody who's bought a car knows that emotions affect financial decisions. For sure. And it's obvious. Yes. For a house. Absolutely. Yeah. Same applies to finances. Hmm. So step two is once you recognize that this is real, just be really careful about when you're making your important decisions. You just don't want to make those decisions when something is going on that is inducing strong emotions. And this includes the seasons, amazingly. So, you know, we just want to be aware of what time of year do we want to make the decisions. If we're making decisions at a point when the market is really, you know, going crazy, that's probably not the best time to make a dramatic change in the portfolio. You know, so these things happen more often in the fall. You know, so maybe make the decisions at a point when there aren't a lot of emotional things going on in your life, markets aren't doing crazy things, and recognize as well that as the seasons change, your appetite for risk might change. So think in advance about how you're going to deal with that. We're making the assumption here, of course, that, that being risk averse is a bad thing. Whereas, you know, being risk averse in September of 2008 was probably a really good thing. Potentially, right? You know, if you were feeling fine until the market started crashing and then all of a sudden you sold everything, that was a really bad time to be risk averse because you ended up selling your assets just when they were worth, you know, quite a, quite a little about right. amount of money. So this is why these drastic changes can be really harmful. There's so many retirees actually who were worried about their nest eggs just at that point and they saw the values of their, their retirement savings plummet. And so they sold. And they sold. They should have hung on. They really should have hung on. Because the market on. always comes back, doesn't it? Well, you hope so. So far, so good. It's, yeah. it's always done so. Hmm. Okay. Just finally, what else are you working on? Well, you know, I'm really fascinated with this experimental line of research where we bring people into the lab or connect with them remotely and get them to participate in experiments. And so I'm continuing to sort of tinker around there. There's this uh, online platform actually run by Amazon. It's called Amazon Mechanical Turk. 
and it allows researchers to hire so-called workers who are just people at home, probably at their computers in their pajamas. We get to hire them to complete little bits of work from home, which can include completing surveys, um, telling us you know, about their mood, um, what financial choices they might make. And we can use this to actually try to learn something about financial decision making. They get paid for it? A little bit. A little bit. <laughs> yes. Okay. Sometimes only 30 cents, but you know, when they're filling out a survey for three minutes and they get 30 cents and then they turn on, you know, they move along to the next one, it builds up. There's behavioral economics for you right there. <laughs> little incentive. Okay, Lisa Kramer, Professor of Finance, Rotman School of Management, U of T. It's good of you to visit us at TVO tonight. Thanks Pleasure a lot. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.